So, you you obviously belong to a pretty recognizably Irish community growing up. Were there any? Um, what was was it a fairly religious community as well? You know, our father was very religious, and I I don't mean to say that he was overly religious, but uh, he made sure we all went to church on Sundays and. And of course, we grew up in Catholic schools, so you had to go to your novenas and you had to do. But my dad went to church on Sundays. That's about, and my mom. But you know, the, all us boys were altar boys. And and actually, where we grew up, it was they called it the Dublin Gulch, where most of us grew up, and it was pretty Irish. And and to this day. We we all have good friends from that, and and we still keep in contact, and you know it's fun to talk about the old days and 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 what you did and uh, how you got in trouble, <laughs> which we all seem to do that too. Maybe that's an Irish tradition too. I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> well, that's I'm I'm intrigued by that. How did you get in trouble? Well. <laughs> For one thing, we raided gardens. We all raided gardens. And then we graduated to uh, maybe breaking a window here or there. And and at times, we had found these piano wires, which are very sturdy. And we lived about a block and a half from a bridge on North Main Street. And we would tie the piano wire across the bridge, across the road. And you'd hear a lot of aerials snapping off the cars. <laughs> so c- consequently, some of the policemen knew my name pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Got in a few car wrecks. Uh, three, I think, to be exact, maybe four. Uh, so we had, <laughs> actually, you know, sometimes you think you had a typical Irish bringing up because Irish have this reputation of being drinkers and stuff. And, uh, and my father liked to have a drink. In fact, when he got older, he was coming home from a bar one night and dressed in a gray suit, which a lot of the older guys wore, and he got hit with a car. And so after that, I mean, he was good for a while, but then he started having many strokes. And So I would be my chore to go up. I was married and had kids by then, but... I'd have to go up and take him to the bar so we could have a couple of beers and a shot. And I'd take him home and he'd go to bed. But so, hmm. Are there any um, church rituals or rites or feast days, any kind of holidays that you recall? You know, the things you recall most, I think, are actually, I believe, when I was very, very young, probably three or four or five, they still used to wake people in the houses around here. And christenings were probably a big thing. You would, all the neighbors and all the family and all the, would be for the christening. So in our case, it was a christening every year because the kids are anywhere from 12 months to 15 months apart. (laughs) So there was a lot of christening. Uh, I don't, I know that the Irish people, my my aunts and my grandmother and not so much my mother because she was born here in Butte, but had a lot of superstitions, Irish superstitions. And if something happened, it it was an omen from this or that. If a bird pecked on a window, somebody was going to die. And uh, a lot of people had visions of people coming to them and they were already dead. So they had a lot of those kind of, maybe they were religious things, I don't know. But since then, I've found in Ireland, they still wake the people in the homes. Uh, when a person dies, and my family, I don't know if it's all families, they stop the clocks at the time of the death, and they cover the mirrors. And I'm not sure what that's all about, but they... Uh, I suppose a ghost isn't supposed to be able to see out of a mirror or something. I don't know for sure, but mm-hmm. they still do that anyway. They still wake them at home. And 
what is a wake like? I've never been to one oh. over there. I mean, I've 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 never made it over when somebody passed away, and I'm sort of glad I didn't because they sit in, and somebody always sits there in the room and and st- sits with the body, and uh, people come and they pass out whatever cookies or or biscuits as they call them over there, and uh, maybe a shot of Jameson's or. I don't know if they can all afford Jameson's, but. (laughs) And I don't know if you guys know, I'm sure you do because if you've been over there. The girls all have hen parties. Have you heard of them? No. Oh. How does that? Well, they'll all go to like my cousin's bed and breakfast for one thing. True. And they'll, six or seven girls will come in there and all rent rooms and then they'll party for a couple, three days. <laughs> and is this before a marriage? Before a marriage. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the husbands evidently go, the husbands sometimes go overseas or Spain or something. The women have what they call a hen party. And some of them go overseas for it, too. But. Hmm. All right. Good to know, Ben. All right. Do you remember, I imagine St. Patrick's Day has always been celebrated. Do you remember anything um, being celebrated on like St. Stephen's Day? No, I've never. Okay. I'm not so sure I've ever heard of St. Stephen's Day. Sure. Is I that think that was maybe an older cultural tradition, St. Stephen's Day. There was something uh, with the Wren boys, it was called, and children would dress up like a certain way. Um, so Bernadette knows more about it. But oh. I think that was maybe a, an older tradition. Oh. It was kind of like the precursor to trick-or-treating on Halloween, I think. Well, yeah, but they don't even call it Halloween. They call it all Hallow's Eve. Or right. And they have some really strange beliefs about that too. The Believe Irish. It. Yeah. Do you? Can you I tell I some about don't that? know if I can tell the story, but my one uncle that was still alive when I got over there was telling me that his my father <clears throat> was a widow at the time, and his daughter, and it was Halloween, and for some reason, she was cleaning out the house. She had all the furniture outside, and. It came to All Hallows' Eves, and if something happened, Pat came home from what he was doing, and boy, they had to hurry to get the furniture in because it was going to be All Hallows' Eve, and that's all I could tell you about it. But mm. it was quite an ordeal to them. It was like a, a bad deal to have the furniture right. outside? Right, yeah. I don't know exactly what like it was. So the spirits are were going to come and sit on the furniture. I don't, mm. I'm not sure what it was. but Sure, it may have been <coughs> you know, one of those things where it was an invitation to the home. Yeah. Home or something like that. Yeah. Interesting. All right. So, can you? We we've talked a little bit about uh, what Butte was like when you were growing up. Can you describe your neighborhood? Uh, what the what the surroundings were like? What the town was like when you were younger? Well, when we were younger, there was much more work in Butte. For one thing, there was miners coming and going at all hours of the day because they worked around the clock. So where we lived, there wasn't, I'm not even sure, I don't think the roads were even paved. We lived about a block and a half from the Mountain Con Mine, uh, which is up on a hill. And my father always used to have older cars, so every time he'd park the car, you'd have to put a rock under it so it wouldn't end up in the neighbor's house. <laughs> Whether the brakes. And winter times were bad up around there because of but there wasn't a lot to do right there. We'd all go down to the field and play baseball. And and uh, my father had this. Uh, back then, the cars weren't very good, for one thing. And if it, and back then, it got a lot colder than it does now. So the car would freeze up. My father would take a roaster and a couple of cart, empty milk cartons and go out and light a fire and put it under the oil pan in the car and warm the oil up, and then the car would start. And I don't know if I heard all the question, maybe. Well, no, that's that's great. I've got a couple oh. of follow-ups for that. But um, d- do you remember any of your neighbors? Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, I remember all my neighbors, actually. Um, there was a family of Wilcox that lived next to us that had, uh, I believe they had four or five girls. And then there was a, guy that lived next to them his name was John Little 
and he had three or four boys, and he was a semi-pro baseball player back years ago. And across the street was the, uh, oh, my God, the Crails were the older people. They were the grandparents of the, uh, oh, one of them's a judge here in town now. Uh, huh. Dara was their name. There was four or five of those kids. They were all younger than me. I had a great friend that lived across the street, Tommy Campbell, and his brother Jerry and his sister Lorena. And Jerry died in really young age, 12 years old or something, the youngest boy. Tommy died in a wreck up this mine up in Whitehall about 20 years ago, and Lorena's dead too, so they're all gone. There's nobody left up there now. The houses are all gone. There's probably six families that live in the whole neighborhood now, and there used to be. Of course, every house was pretty close to each other. Sure. And it wasn't. Oh, you know, they had, you know, the families came and went, too. So you had friends for a while, and then you didn't have friends. And Depending on how the workflow was down at the mine. Then well, or a lot of people didn't like view. A lot of people didn't like the cold weather. So if they had to spend a winter here, then they'd probably move on to California or something. And that's true of some of them that that they'd moved on because they didn't like the weather. Mm. We didn't have no choice. I don't know where you'd move eight kids to in <laughs> in one car with your father driving. <laughs> well, how what sort of changes have you seen in Butte as a whole over the years? Well, I don't know if I've. Seen a lot of changes. I, I I believe Butte is probably one of the, you know, Butte used to be a very strong union town, and and it that was probably both good and bad, because. But Butte has never given up. You know, they're they're, the pit started and and that changed everything in Butte. Took out Meaderville. Took out East Butte. Took out. Uh, but I you know that. Some businesses come, like Stoffer Chemical was there for 40 years, I suppose, and now they got asthma. But the people of Butte are pretty pretty determined to keep going. I believe that. When we, when we were kids, not only did we deliver papers in the morning, but in the afternoon we would sell papers. It was called the Butte Daily Post. And... There was probably, in every block in Butte, there was probably 15 bars. I mean, there was bars everywhere. In fact, one time, just by being goofy, a bunch of us counted 156 bars in Butte. But when we were kids, 8, 9, 10 years old, 11 years old, you'd stand on the corner and sell papers, and these miners would come by and hand a dollar bill out there, and you'd get to keep it, you know, but... But the bars were where the big money was. You could go in there and get tips. <laughs> so, and and as enterprising as we all were on St. Patrick's Day, we'd go buy a bunch of little shamrocks and stuff, and then go to all the bars and send the redheaded kid in there, which was my younger brother, and <laughs> he'd he'd get to sell the shamrocks. He'd come out with three or four dollars and still have all the shamrocks, but he got a few tips anyway. <laughs> Um, what places stand out most in your mind? Um, See, I, I, I guess I don't know how to answer that question either because I, like I say, I went to work when I was 12 years old, yeah. so I didn't, you know, I, I didn't, I played ball till I was maybe 14, mm -hmm. and then we worked, and you just worked and went home, and and when you're working two jobs when you're 13 years old, you know, it's it's pretty hard to have too much. You know, there was always friends and there was always good times. And they're fair, you know, Gregson, as we used to call it then. But I don't know that we participated in that too much. Like I said, my father was a terrible driver, so we didn't go a lot of places. But you'd have the YMCA. There used to be a guy here that taught us all gymnastics. His name was Bert Van Meel. And he was at Olympic uh, on that bars or something. So that was a lot of fun. We'd go up there and we'd play basketball and do gym stuff. And uh, 
Bowling was a lot of fun. I was bowling from the time I was 14 till I got drafted. Uh, that's probably about it. Are there any historical events of, of note, like world conflicts or any anything on a grander scale that you've seen affect your family or your community? Uh, I don't know that anything has af affected our family. I'm sure World War II did, but I mean, uh, my father was probably draft age at that time, but because he was working in the mines, they all got deferments for working in the mines when the World War II. Uh, I'm sure Vietnam wasn't very f much fun for them because I was, I'm sure my dad was glued to the TV because I was gone for 13 months, but. Uh, That's great. Um, yeah. did, that you know of, are there any special sayings or expressions in your family? Oh, yeah, there's probably a lot of special sayings, but they <laughs> probably wouldn't fit on this. <laughs> no, I don't know. My, you know, my mother used to, bless her heart, she used to, when you wouldn't come home, see, that was the thing about us when we were growing up. You'd go out in the morning, you'd eat your breakfast, and, and then you go out in the morning, and you might not come home till dinner time. So she'd stand out on the back porch, and you could hear her for blocks calling all the names, you know. And it was never just Neil or, or, or Jimmy or Danny. It was uh, the whole name. Uh, James Patrick and Daniel Thomas and Neil Anthony. And she would scream our names till, till the... <laughs> That's great. Was there any particular way that she yell yell your name any particular organization of that when you knew you were really in trouble yeah and and as a matter of fact i have friends that still laugh about it because she would stand up there and it would be neil anthony <laughs> she would roar the name and <laughs> so i don't know if i was really in trouble but i did get in trouble so you, you knew it was time to come yeah, home. When you yeah, it was time to come home. <laughs> and it wasn't usually for meals she was calling us either because my, my father did a lot of the cooking. My mother made some really special meals, but my dad did a lot of the cooking. Mm. Wow. Are there any, wh what uh, calendar holidays do you, do you celebrate? You know, when we were growing up, and you asked me this before, if there was any special religious things, when when the mass used to be said in Latin in Butte, and and when it was Christmas Eve was supposed to probably the most special day to anybody, especially with a a family of eight kids and a mom and dad or nine kids or ten other kids or going to Christmas Eve mass because it was just a really really good service, and it was it meant a lot to all of us. You know, birthdays were birthdays. Christmas was the way we always felt, the older siblings always felt that it was for the younger ones anyway, because a lot of times mom and dad couldn't afford to buy stuff, so we bought stuff. But but the 4th of July was always a big deal in Butte. And and we weren't around, you know, back when we were kids, there was no Henri Raw days or, or any of that kind of stuff. So, And there was none of these other festivals, which are quite interesting too, you know, but... Uh, you know, I pl like I told you before, I played in a lot of sports. I played football for St. Mary's grade school. I played basketball for St. Mary's. Played base Little League baseball for the Northwest Little League. And my parents never did come to a game. I don't know if they didn't have the time. Probably never had the time. But Mom, of course, couldn't get around too much anyway. But Because my mother was the second girl's worst driver. <laughs> when When we used to... We were moving from St. Joseph's School up to St. Mary's. My father was up there working on the house, which like I told you was about a block and a half from the con mine. And so my mother would drive us up to school. But the old St. Mary's School used to be a big three-story building on Wyoming Street, and, and it was my mother's biggest fear was driving in the wintertime, of course. And as you come over this one street, you have to go down a hill, and, and she would always try to slow down, but she could 
was scared to hit the brakes, so she would always hit the same pole every day when she, <laughs> when she brought us to school. And that's the truth. <laughs> oh, boy. That's great. So you, you say your uh, father cooked a lot of the meals. Um, he cooked a lot of the breakfast meals because, he, like I say, he was graveyard. You know, and, and he worked graveyard most of his life. Well, most of his later life because, like I said, he got hurt so bad a couple of times in the mines. But, yeah, he liked to cook. Do you recall any of the... Uh, were his any pancakes were the best pancakes in the world. And and actually, my mother made a, a meal that was called Slum Gullion, and I don't know where they ever come up with that name, but it's spaghetti and meatballs and other stuff in it. And what did she call it? Slum Gullion, mm -hmm. and it was the best. She done, it. and then I'll tell you another thing about my mother. She made the best potato salad in the world, best potato salad. Is there anything at uh, at holidays? Would they make anything special? Not really. I'm sure, we had Irish stew on on St. Patrick's Day, but that's great. <laughs> what, um, if any, what family heirlooms or keepsakes do you have? Well, one of the grandkids, I'm not sure which one it is, has my father's fiddle still. Uh, Mom and Dad, when they went back to Ireland, that was before, you know, we were still young and married, all of us, and they brought everybody back a few Irish things. So that was pretty popular. Uh, we have a lot of pictures and we have a lot of things. that Mom and Dad used to write back and excuse me, back and forth to Ireland, and we have a lot of those letters. And and they were, uh, it was sort of a, and I'm sure you heard this before, but the people in Ireland didn't want to run out of room when they were writing letters, so they would write normally across paper, but then if they had something else to say, they'd turn the paper sideways and write up this way, and then turn it sideways and write down this way. So, so we have some of them. Oh, is it okay? Yep. Oh. That's great. And I do have to tell you one thing, and I probably should interject this. My father came here in 1929, and I've been to Roy, Montana. I've been to Lewistown, Montana, and I've done a lot of research here, and I still have not found my father's citizenship papers. No kidding. No kidding. And I know he had to be a citizen. <laughs> he paid taxes, but I've never found him, and I don't know why that is. Hmm. Whether maybe he didn't. Maybe back then you didn't have to. I don't know. Because I know he paid taxes. He voted. Yeah. And I thought all of that was a prerequisite for being a citizen, but <laughs> I don't know. It, was there any sort of naturalization that the company did when they brought people over from Ireland? Oh, he didn't come over with anybody. Right. He he just came on his own. I think his in fact I think his uncle paid his fare over here. And I even know how much that was. That was eighteen pounds, I think it was. Back then I don't know if they still had if they had pounds back in the twenties, but it was 18 something anyway. I know what ship he came on. I know what, you know, we know every, when he arrived, we know everything about him. But Wh What was the ship that he came over on? The Caledonia. Yeah. A lot of folks that came over on. On the Caledonia. Mm -hmm. But you know, with this time when we were over in, in Ireland, we went to uh, Cove. Have you heard of it? Mm -hmm. And that's where the, a lot of the ships debarked from. Plus, they also brought a lot of criminals over to Australia, and I don't know if you knew that or not, but mm. but they were having some sort of a ceremony there. But but my father never left from there. My father left from Scotland. But then we went up and seen, and I and that's they had some kind of deal there for the Titanic too. And the Titanic was built in Belfast. I'm sure you're aware of that. But but they have a replica of that up there now in Belfast, and we went and seen that this time too. Well, in the Lusitania. Um, didn't they take some of the, the few that survived that into a port near there, uh, near... Near it, Belfast? It, it may have been near Cove. I don't, I don't know. Oh, yeah, it could be was, Cove, yeah. It, it was torpedoed near... Oh, the Lusitania. Yeah. Oh, well, that might be what the in ceremony they were having there then. World War... Gosh, I guess that was World War One. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Um, okay, great. Um... What, what sort of documentation do you have, um, physical documentation 
from your relatives in terms of naturalization papers and, and all that and photos? I have my father's birth certificate. I have his passport. I have uh, his birth, or I had said his birth certificate. I have his, of course, I have his marriage license and that, but that's immaterial. But I don't have his, I don't even have his declaration of, of but I, I, my uncle, the one he came to see, Patty McKay, I have his declaration of, what do you call it, the, when you apply for declaration citizenship? Declaration of citizenship, or, or is it a declaration of, gosh, I don't know. I'm it's over here on the table. But anyway, he, he got refused because I believe it was around 1918 he was doing it, and it was wartime, and he probably refused to go into the... I see. I believe. That, but all it says is, is that he has turned down... Can you hold it one minute? Oh, no problem. I'm going to get that. I just, I, I've never seen one like this. Yeah, this is a copy of his petition for natural. I also have my. Are you? Coming? I also have my grandfather's petition for naturalization and his. Wow. And I have on my, which is John Nolan, and his brother. I have that. I I believe I might have something for Dugan too. But this here was for my uncle, my granduncle, my dad's uncle, the one he came to see in Roy, Montana. And it was his petition for naturalization. And it was on October 1907. Oh, 1913. But anyway, in the back of it, it says, Order of Court Denying Petition. Upon consideration of the petition, Patrick McKay Huh. Why did I see this? Upon consideration of, pet of the petition, Patrick McKay, 28th of January 1916, the petition has a... Wow. But anyway, it said the petition is hereby denied without prejudice. Wow. I don't understand why I'm... You, you think maybe it was because he, he he wasn't willing to enter the service? I believe it was because it was 1916 and that was World War One. So, right. uh, so when did he? When was it approved? When did he? I don't know that. Okay. This is all I've ever found from him because he lived in in Roy, Montana, then, which is Fergus County. Right. And since that time, he, which is another thing he done that I didn't know they could do, is they the government bought back his uh, homestead. Okay. And then he moved to California, and so, and he worked as a fireman there, so I don't know when he got his, but he yes. didn't get it this time anyway. Wow, that's so interesting. I've never heard of that. Uh, yeah, I haven't either. And when I seen it, I couldn't believe it because it was denied without prejudice, and I don't know what that means even for, hmm. for sure. But. Hmm. Wow. And it says his petition has a in Fergus County, which is Lewistown. But even names the, the judge had a heck of a hand, Jeremiah Lynch. Yeah. Wow. So, I don't know. But I've never found my father's either. I found my grandfather's on my mother's side and, and my uncle on my mother's side, but that's it. So we're still looking for them. Good deal. Well, it seems like you've done some pretty incredible sleuth work so far. <laughs> yeah, we've got quite the history collected. Yeah. That's awesome. Hope you pass that, pass that down to... Well, it's all there for my kids. Yeah, that's great. So. Um, okay, a few more questions here. Do you yourself partake in any cultural traditions of Irish origin? No, I don't. No. Yeah. Um, are you, are, do you belong to any organizations like the AOH or? No, or the none of it, the Hibernians or none of it. No, I don't okay. belong to any of it. No. Sure. Um, Now, 
Now you've been back to Ireland several times. How, how many times have you been? Back? We've been back to Ireland seven times. The first time in 1995. And we were trying to go every other year, but some years we missed a year. But yeah, we've been back seven times and loved every minute of it. That's great. Yeah. It's, it seems to be the pattern um, in your generation and um, ge the generations after the initial one that came over. It, the pattern seems to be that they didn't like to talk about it. And then the generation after them, you know, had moved back and reconnected with their roots. Why, why do you think that was that they didn't talk about it? I. You know, like I said before, I, I believe it's because they just had such a hard life. Mm -hmm. And they and my father maybe had an extra special reason because I believe he was involved in the IRA back in the early 1900s. And I believe it was a good thing back then. In fact, I have the I have the address to look for, see if he has any records in there. And, and so I'm going to do that. But I do have one story to tell you about that. And that's my uncle, which who is still alive. He was 80 something at the time I was there was telling me stories about my dad. And he said, uh, one day they were working on the farm. They were putting up their hay. And these guys come up to my grandpa, John Duddy, and said, uh, we need Neil tomorrow. And grandpa said, we're putting up hay, and Neil's not going anywhere tomorrow. He said, we got to put up the hay. He said, don't worry about your hay. We need Neil tomorrow. And my uncle told me this exactly, he said, the next day, my dad was gone, and there was two other guys putting up the hay. So whatever he did, or however he did it, I don't know about anybody else, but I, I'm proud of him for it, because he fought for what he believed in. Wow. Yeah. That's great. This is kind of a little bit off the topic we've been talking about, but do you remember any traditional home cures for common ailments, or... Uh, you know, within your family or your community at large? You used to put, they used to put Vicks on your chest and cold rags and or hot rags. And there used to be something for warts, and I can't remember what that used to be, but mm -hmm. they used to put some kind of, mix something up and put it on the warts. And, uh, and it did the trick, huh? <laughs> Evidently, yeah. <laughs> um, and we kind of already covered the, superstitions question if there were any of those oh there was a lot of them yeah. a lot of them that's great well just two more questions then um what are some of the most or maybe the most striking changes in your life so far oh boy that's sort of a tough question yeah uh of course I've probably lived longer than I thought I was going to live to begin with, but uh, you know we were we were brought up in in such a and I don't want to say a poor because I don't think, but we were brought up in a very meager home, and I think what everybody's hope is that their kids will do a lot better than they did, and I think for that reason I believe that I done a lot better than my father done not because I was smarter than him. Not be, but I had more opportunities, and he worked a lot harder than I worked, and and still survived. And you know he survived till he was seventy-two, and I think that's what every tradition of every family is: is that you want your family, your kids, to do better than you. And so consequently, now I want my kids to do better than me, and I've done well. I mean, we we have survived, and we get to travel all the time. We want to travel and. So I'm pretty fortunate that way. So I want my kids to be better than that. And that's that's the most changes you've seen, I guess. That's great. So um, this is the last question I've got for you. If if you were to write the history of the Irish in Montana, what would you include for future generations? I think what I would include is that they came over here looking for a future, looking to the ones that came and left their families came here to better themselves and to better their family. A lot of them got to do that, but a lot of them died in the process, so they never got to improve their family. I, I don't know that, I think that every Irishman had in their, in their bucket list, if you want to call it that, to 
be better than they were in Ireland and and to and to succeed in life and and I think they all did but I also believe a lot of them in Ireland have done the, the same I mean Ireland is not the poor country it was back then either so so I think a lot of it is just hard determination and Irish have a lot of that that's great is there anything else that you'd like to to add or any any stories you'd like to include for the record well you know I just Wait one minute here. There's a piece of paper there I want to show you, and you guys can take it with you. If this here was a few years ago. They done a thing in the paper to interview Irish people that were seeking their roots. Uh -huh. <coughs> and this is, it's called the Green Gazette. It was in our Montana standard. Oh, and it's got all the counties broken down. Right, and it's got what families were in what county, but... See, I don't, they've probably got an O'Dowd name in there. Well, that's great. But anyway, they've done a story of Family Ties Brings Duddy Back Home. And they've done a, it's a pretty nice story, but. Oh, that's and, great. And this is my uncle and I standing in front of their cemetery right about five blocks from his house. Wow. <clears throat> which was probably a very important thing to me at that time. But at the back of this article, I wrote, I said something about my father, because my uncle had told me that my father had ties to the IRA. <laughs> and my siblings were all very upset at me <laughs> because they didn't think that that was a good thing, but I thought it was a good thing. So. But anyway, if, if you want to take that, and there is some things there, if you want to, you know, take a picture of it, you can. you're sure. welcome to. Now, is that something that uh, you'd like? photocopied and then returned oh no we got more of them you, so you sure yeah okay yeah. all right um yeah it, the things that we can't take we'll take a picture of oh sure and the things that you're all right with sending with us and is that below that uh no we'd like to that that you should hang on to. yeah okay yeah great. we'll take a photo of that yeah okay perfect okay. okay well let's take some shots and actually brandon will take a still of you just a, a photo 